Welcome to the WWE Podcast Week in Review. So much to talk about tonight. News is flooding in, and the past two weeks have just been crazy. With releases, Sasha Banks is now officially gone from WWE. Tim White, we just learned, has passed away. Brock Lesnar returned, and so much more. You're not going to want to miss this show, guys. Let's get everything going right after this. You got to check out the Mentality Show. If you could be a fly on the wall and could hear how men think and really want to hear what goes on in the minds of everyday men, then you should check out The Mentality Show every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook Live. Real men, real talk. The Mentality Show. You can find them anywhere you stream podcasts and YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look up The Mentality Show. This is WWE superstar Drew McIntyre, and you're listening to the WWE Podcast. The one that everybody wants, me. This is my honor. You're going to acknowledge me. Hey everybody, welcome to the WWE Podcast. It is Sunday, July 19th, 2022. Happy Father's Day to all those fathers out there. I hope everybody enjoyed their day and that uh, you had some time off, do something you enjoy, whatever that may be. Uh, mine was, you know, kind of the same as every other day, I have to say. <laughs> kind of the same as every day. Like you have plans and you want to do this and that and then, you know, just... Life takes over and you just end up doing the same thing you did the day before, right? Like taking care of your kids and and taking care of lunches and poopy diapers and no sleep. And like, it's the same thing. Like my life over the last three, four years has just been a blur. The days are long. The years are fast. Somebody said that to me and I'm like, that is so effing true. Anybody that's parents out there, you can relate. And then, you know, you, you miss them when it's bedtime, it's weird. Like you, you want to get rid of them in a way during the day and you want to just have your free time. You miss your freedom. You miss sleeping in, you miss that kind of stuff and you're stressed out. And sometimes you get really angry with them and then they go to bed and you're like, Oh, I miss them. It's the strangest thing. And then you feel bad about the things maybe you yelled at them earlier in the day. I don't know what that is, but I think a lot of parents go through that anyway. Uh, I don't know how I get off track so quickly, so easily. It's 10 seconds into the show, guys. Happy Father's Day to everybody that uh, that celebrates, and I hope everyone enjoyed their day and is now on to, what is the next holiday? Till 4th of July. 4th of July is the next holiday that comes up in just a couple of weeks. And well, if you're a wrestling fan, another holiday comes along too. It's called Money in the Bank, and that is July 2nd, 2022 at the MGM in Las Vegas. And guys, you know we've got so much to talk about with this week in review. Uh, But there has been so much stuff off camera that's been going on (laughs) that like I really I'm not sure where to begin. I mean, we we could have had an entire show every day this week dedicated to just the news coming out. Um, But I will start with Tim White, longtime WWE referee. Uh, He died at the age of 68. And um, this is uh, according to Fox News. Again, I'm not getting political on, oh, you watch Fox. This is a very subject or objective, <laughs> like uh, non-political news outlet here, or, or uh, at least article. So he, they uh, said that White worked for WWE for more than 20 years. He started working with Andre the Giant and was part-time referee when he began the year I was born. My God, they don't have that in there, they, um, which is kind of just disrespectful. They should have me in there. Anytime 1985 comes on. I mean, I don't know how they don't uh, reference me, but they said he began in 1985 and he was part of some of the most famous matches in company history, including most famously, if you're a more modern fan somewhat, the 1998 Hell in a Cell match between The Undertaker and Mankind at the King of the Ring pay-per-view. But unfortunately, that was also when a shoulder injury effectively ended uh, Tim White's in-ring career. But while White remained a major part of WWE working behind the scenes as, as an official and talent agent until 2009, uh, WWE extends its condolences to White's family and friends and fans. And WWE stars Shawn Michaels and Big E were among those that paid tribute. Um, yeah. Uh, so, and, and honestly, <laughs> which on, I mean, I, I don't know if this is something I'll ever mention, but uh, maybe it's too soon. <laughs> Maybe it's just, 
it, 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 you know what? It is too soon, but I'm that guy that's going to create people sighing or eye rolling. It looks like Tim White finally succeeded. Just ask Josh Matthews. Those of you that know what I'm talking about, it's a very dark joke. If you don't, there was a series of attempted suicide videos that were done as part of a ongoing like story with Tim White, who had become severely depressed after you know this injury that happened in 98. Imagine something like happened. I, I, and I'm making light of the story, not his death. Of course, it's sad. I don't see a cause of death, by the way. Um, I, I don't know what it was. I don't know if it was a long time illness. 68 is not, not old. Okay. 68 is a um, really, really, uh, I mean, kind of a shocking age to die if it was a natural causes. I don't know the cause of death. Um, but uh, nonetheless, I don't think they'll be bringing up those attempted suicide videos. And Josh Matthews, yeah, that's not wise, Mr. White. If you don't know what I'm talking about, guys, and it is ill timed. Some of you are going, why is he bringing? What a jerk. I don't know how I don't just see the irony in this. Um, and, and uh, you know, Josh Matthews uh, and Tim White were, were going on some just imagine that content airing today. I mean, there were some things that Tim White did, like, you know, trying to electrocute himself, throwing himself into like a, a giant fan, uh, you know, shooting himself, drowning himself. Um, it, it's really, it's shocking. Okay. You won't believe it. Just YouTube it. YouTube, Tim White, like suicide videos or something. I'm not even kidding. It sounds morbid, but this, this is what WWE did. This is their own content. So anyway, in real life, we are sad that Tim White has passed and, uh, you know, condolences as well. And hope all is, uh, healed. And, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know the cause of death. I really don't. You know, that'll come out in time if if the family or, and her friends decide that it's appropriate. So we can just assume at this point it's natural causes. You know, so. Um, all right. Well, beyond that, guys, I mean, that, that was the most recent news, but we have Brock Lesnar returning to SmackDown. Uh, we'll talk about that. Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll talk about much more, too, as Sasha Banks apparently is not apparently is officially gone from WWE. We'll talk about that. Uh, you know, those news stories up front. But first, I want to let you know that uh, Mimi is returning. She's returning to the AEW review team in just two weeks. The probably the most I should have led with this. I mean, this is the biggest news of the entire week. Oh, you know, above Tim White's death, above Brock Lesnar, above Sasha Banks uh, being released or asking for her release. Well, we don't know yet, but being gone from WWE. I mean, Mimi returning is uh, earth-shattering news. I don't know how it's not top of the headlines on all news types, news websites, but. She's returning to the AEW review team, and I appreciate everybody who has filled in over the last several uh, months. It feels like it feels like it's been a couple of months. I think it has, and we'll be welcoming her back in just a couple of months or a couple of, couple of weeks. At the end of June, she'll be covering AEW, and I'm sure she is ready to go. As as it's been too long since we've had her, and I do appreciate everybody who's filled in from Memphis Mark to uh, the. Uh, you know, uh, Kanye Twitty, I think filled in one week and I don't know if somebody else filled in, but you know, we've patched it together and we've made it work and I'm appreciative. So, all right. Well, beyond that too, guys, check out our, uh, our partner podcasts. That is Ashley man, the kick ash podcast, K I K A S H the football function podcast done by Michael Ritter, who will cover SmackDown here on the WWE podcast and the evolutionary wrestling podcast that's done by grace. Check that out. And one more thing, one more thing, guys, and it's not go ad free, which is on Patreon for a dollar. That's not it. Although I just did it. See how sneaky that is. But uh, there's something possibly bigger brewing here on the podcast. And what I mean by that is video in a way that's <clears throat> um, much different than I expected. I, I might be on a streaming service in the near future. And I don't mean Netflix or Hulu. OK, uh, not that big. Let, let's let's uh, let's ground ourselves here but a network that has many thousand viewers per month. So I don't want to give any details in terms of where or when, but a deal could be forthcoming with this show. Um, now, now, again, things could fall through and I hope they don't. So I'm excited for it right now. It's in preliminary talking stages. We're getting things kind of lined up and if it's going to be a fit and that, and that kind of stuff. 
But if all works out well, I think at the beginning of July, we could have a video show once a week done on a streaming service um, that you've probably not heard of, but they're, they've been very successful over the last couple of years that they've been around. And so details will be forthcoming on that. Hopefully if, if, if you don't hear from me ever, like if I don't talk about it ever again, that like it just, I say it today and then just, you're like, wait, what did he say last week? Why, why is he not talking about it? That means just, it didn't work out. <laughs> okay. Cause like, there's been times where I've said, oh, you know, I might be doing this and that. And then like, I just don't talk about it ever again. That means it didn't, that didn't work out. And you know, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> That's all that means. So I'm probably, I'm, I'm rolling the dice here uh, of, of uh, possibly embarrassing myself, but I feel good about it. And I think things may work out with uh, details forthcoming about a video one hour show that's going to be on a streaming service and it'll be kind of a, uh, it, I'll be recording it on a Wednesday. So I'll get raw in. I won't get SmackDown in, even though the show is going to air on a Saturday on this network. Um, but again, before I give it too much away, more info coming, hopefully. So, all right, let's get into it guys. I mean, I know I have so much to talk about today besides just <laughs> wrestling, uh, in, in terms of the product itself with deaths and, and this show and other podcasts, but let's get into it. Brock Lesnar returns guys. Brock Lesnar's back and the crowd in Minneapolis. I mean, it's a good spot to bring Brock back. It's your biggest chance of having a big reaction, right? The former hometown boy. He doesn't reside there anymore. He's a former uh, hometown boy, as I said, because he's in Saskatchewan with a 12 foot fence around his house famously. And so apparently that's where Brock's been the last two months as he just cyclically takes months off after WrestleMania and then appears just before SummerSlam, which is what he's doing. Now, he is likely going to take a uh, shot at Roman Reigns at the Money in the Bank event in MGM, in Vegas, big platform. Apparently, WWE didn't feel Riddle could fit the bill and sell tickets. I don't agree with that. I think that Riddle is, and it honestly puts on a better match than Brock and Roman does. And honestly, a lot of people are are doing this when it comes to Brock. I mean, at least at home, because if you're in the arena and you hear Brock Lesnar's music, yeah, you're probably going to react. It's a big, it's a big return, even though it's been only a couple of months. And, you know, and, and Roman doesn't show up on SmackDown a lot, so you put the ingredients together, and it's just in the moment you're like, oh, cool. And then if you take five seconds to think about it, you, you and everybody at home is going like this. <sighs> <sighs> That's what we're doing. It is a collective yawn. I'm sorry. It is. Um, Brock Lesnar is a once in a lifetime talent. We will never see someone like Brock Lesnar again. And him and Roman have had some decent matches. WrestleMania was not one of them. I did not like their WrestleMania match at all. Um, I thought it was just, again, it's not that the effort wasn't there. It just, to me, that was one of the matches that didn't work out. They've had other ones that have been better. And, you know, I, I wasn't a fan. And so anyway, I said that if Brock Lesnar comes back on Monday Night Raw after WrestleMania and, and decides to challenge Roman again at Backlash, you know, that the fans are going to revolt. And I think WWE has had the benefit of being able to take a couple of months between that and a little bit of time makes the heart grow fonder. And so people are excited to see Brock again. But come on. I mean. Was was Brock Brock brought back for the sole purpose of just losing to Roman Reigns? Is that the is that what was put in the contract? I know Brock has had one he's had like one victory since he returned. By the way, I think it was to defeat in the Fatal Five Way. He beat Big E. I think he was the final one uh, for the WWE Championship, which was just a mechanism to get all titles to Roman Reigns, obviously. But that was, I believe, the only victory was in that fatal five-way match. So now we have Brock Lesnar back and again <laughs> facing Roman Reigns. Uh, guys, I, I don't know what to do. I mean, the thing, I, I want to be mad. They gel well together most times. I, I, I'm just, I'm over it. I'm beyond over Brock and Roman. And it shows you that they don't have faith in Riddle to headline that event, which I think he would have been doing done just fine and they would have had a better match quality wise. But Vince goes for the bigger star and goes back to the well again. And again, Brock Lesnar is still capable of putting on a really good match. 
at least in terms of Brock Lesnar terms, right? I mean, what a good, what a really good match is for Brock is not the same as what a really good match is for Matt Riddle. But Brock Lesnar is still capable of that. He's still an absolute beast. He's collecting millions of dollars. But I feel like we've seen this time and time and time and time again. How many times do we need to see this? I'm done. It's over. Find new opponents for Roman. There are people waiting out there. Now, I have no idea if Randy is truly going to be out for till the end of this year or past this year. That's the latest is that Randy is actually not going to be. But clearly, he is an opponent for Roman upon his return, which, again, we don't know when that is. I've heard many, many different rumors. So, yes, Randy is going to be a future opponent for Roman, which automatically, automatically disqualifies Brock Lesnar from having any chance against Roman Reigns at the event, at the Money in the Bank event. And it looks like, from what I'm hearing, spoiler alert, okay, you've had your chance to mute me or skip ahead. It's apparently going to be a last man standing match with Roman at the event. And if that's the case, I mean, all that is is just another way for Brock to lose. I mean, it's just they've invented another way for Brock to lose. And I'm just, this doesn't interest me at all. It doesn't. To be honest with you, the Brock Lesnar return is fun. But what the most important thing said to me on SmackDown by the announcers was by actually Michael Cole. And he said, Riddle has arrived. Anybody else pick up on that? To me, this was the statement victory of Riddle. Or I'm sorry, the statement match of Riddle. Even in defeat, it felt like he won. He put on an excellent match. This match felt big time. I loved the match between these two. There were some moments you said, oh my God, when he when he countered the spear into the RKO, even Paul Heyman, who sells things, gosh darn brilliantly on the outside. He doesn't overreact but he shows concern when it's appropriate. Paul Hammond's an absolute genius, not just on the mic, but in body language. But when he did that, everyone was like, oh my God. You know, oh, oh, oh my God, right? In the moment. He had that that sense of like in that second. And so to me, that was a very, very telling moment. And, and you know what? Michael Cole's exactly right. I'm not a huge fan of Cole, but you know, he has had a he's had a a couple decades of experience now. He knows what to say and when sometimes. Oftentimes he doesn't, but Cole, as much criticism as he gets, I think he's unfairly compared to Jim Ross. And the problem is with Cole, he kind of preceded Ross, the greatest announcer of all time, in my opinion. And you know, of course, when you try to fill shoes that can't be filled, you're automatically at a disadvantage. So I don't think that's fair to Cole. Uh, but he did say an awesome thing this week, and it's exactly right. Like Riddle has arrived. But if you didn't think he had before, this week did it, even in a loss to Roman. And the spear out of midair, of course, keeps Roman as champion. And, you know, Roman did his part too. And God, does Roman look like a champion, doesn't he? And just just a few weeks off of SmackDown, doesn't it feel huge that he was there this week? I understand there's a lot of you out there that don't like Roman. I understand that. I know why. Many of you have vocalized it on, on TikTok, on, you know, on, uh, in your mailbags to me. I understand why you don't like Roman. I understand why you're tired of this storyline. He's champion for too long. It's the same thing all the time. You know, this and that. And and now you're probably going to even double down on your criticism because they're going back to the well again for like the, like the fourth time with Brock Lesnar in a year. I mean, it's absurd to have Brock lose again. <laughs> um, so, hey, I understand your criticism of it, but Roman Reigns, like it or not, is still the biggest thing they have going. And you can't tell me this week that it didn't feel important he was there. Absence is going to be Roman Reigns' best friend to keep things somewhat fresh. And yes, I would like a champion on Raw because Roman, for all intents and purposes, is still a SmackDown guy, even though he has both championships. So anyway, this Money in the Bank, by the way, has got so much riding on it and, and really so much intrigue because I think Seth has a hell of a case to stake. Drew McIntyre has a hell of a case to stake. Uh, Sheamus, of course, doesn't. We all knew, by the way, that that conclusion was going to be put both of them in the match. We, we kind of knew that. So anyway, 
Guys, uh, let's take a quick break. On the other side, I'm going to dive into something I didn't mention at the top of the show. Vincent Kennedy McMahon and his appearance on SmackDown. Whew, I've got some things to say about this. You're not going to want to miss it. So stay right here. We'll be right back. You got to check out the mentality show. If you could be a fly on the wall and could hear how men think and really want to hear what goes on in the minds of everyday men, then you should check out the mentality show every Wednesday at 6 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook live real men, real talk, the mentality show. You can find them anywhere you stream podcasts and YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just look up The Mentality Show. Welcome back to the WWE Podcast. Let's get back to more great wrestling audio. All right, well, let's let's dive into events, okay? And I haven't really had a chance since the whole thing went down with Vince McMahon and, and the whole $3 million hush-hush settlement that he paid out to one or multiple women who are no longer employed. Some are, I think one of them's a paralegal. <clears throat> and as Vince, quote-unquote, steps aside, we'll get to that, Stephanie steps in and is the interim CEO of WWE. So, okay. You wonder also, as a sub-story sub here, if Stephanie knew when she, quote unquote, kind of stepped aside from WWE's day to day responsibilities as chief brand officer or whatever she was, that if she knew that this was going to come out and therefore wanted to give time to distance herself from WWE, therefore kind of abs abs absolving herself of any culpability of knowledge that she, you know, could have her hands dirty knowing that this was the case. So how could you be employed by a company? Now she has the plausible deniability of like, well, I, I didn't know. You know, that was months ago I stepped away, right? Like, I don't know. Yeah. I, I'm not accusing, but the timing is very suspicious, right? Like Stephanie's been with WWE day to day, every day for, you know, how many years she's been alive, 40 years, whatever, like every day from cradle until now. And then just suddenly two months before the whole scandal comes out about her father, she steps away. Is the timing very suspicious? Absolutely. You know, I don't really, I'm not a big fan of coincidences. So anyway, make that what of you will of make of that what you will. But uh, moving on to Vince himself, as he quote unquote steps aside, even though he's involved in the creative still, people don't understand that. You know, Vince stepped aside. I don't know exactly what his title is right now. He's like kind of CEO one B. <laughs> I don't know, but he still is in creative control. So while he's not named CEO, he's still doing all the same functions that he was doing at least from what I'm understanding from a creative standpoint that a CEO would do. So Vince, even though he doesn't have the, the, the official title is still kind of wielding the same power in the company, even though Stephanie is the interim. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think from a creative standpoint, you're going to see much change. Now, if Vince is found guilty uh, from this committee that is doing its investigation from the board, and things are proven that he did to do a hush hush. Does Vince actually step down and step away from the company? If that happens, yeah, things I guess could change a little, but you still have Kevin Dunn. Okay. You still have the Mc, a McMahon in charge. Uh, you, even if Vince does step away, it's not going to be a night and day. Oh my God, Vince is gone. Everything's going to be great. I would be very, very cautious of that assumption that all of us, including myself at one point, was like, yeah, Vince is the sole problem. I mean, he, he is the, the, if you like to create a kind of dark analogy, he's the head of the snake. But there, you know, the, uh, the rest of the snake still exists in the company, namely those people that were, have been working with Vince day to day, know what they, or at least have their comfort zones and, just take the company kind of in the same direction Vince has had. And and it's going to take a long time to get the cancer out of WWE just because Vince is gone. He's like a tumor. And, and again, I, I feel so bad in doing this to Vince in terms of just calling him this way, even though nothing's been proven yet. So I'm going the presumption of innocence. I, I'm trying. I'm trying to take the traditional stance of innocent to proven guilty. Although you know, I'm look, would I be surprised if he's guilty? No, but my point is with, with Vince, assumingly he's gone. Say he's gone, right? Big news story. Everyone loses their mind. Oh my God, Vince is gone. WWE is going to be great. 
the cancer runs deep. The rot runs deep, right? In terms of the things they do that that I think undermine pro wrestling, right? The production, little things with the production. You guys have heard me mention that uh, how many times? People talking with their backs to the TV. The same way they go to commercial break every every single time. The same way everyone has to welcome you to Monday Night Raw all the time. The same kind of corporate buzzwords. They tell us that anything could happen, but in reality, it's the exact opposite that anything could happen because they make us feel the opposite way. Like all these things add up into just a garbage sandwich. And it's not just Vince propagating this stuff. The people that have been working with Vince, I mean, you'd have to back up the truck, right? You'd have to clean house and start fresh with like brand new creative with everyone, everyone involved in the creative process from production to writing to like everything, right? You would have to back up the truck and clean house. That ain't happening. So with Vince gone, sure, an element of a big element of the problem with, again, the perceived problem with things wrong with creative may change a little, but you're still having a McMahon in charge. You're still having everybody, assumingly that was working with Vince, still have the same ideas. They're not different people. They're the same people, presumably functioning the same way in their brains. So I don't know. People think that Vince being gone will be a cure-all. I doubt it. And that's even considering that Vince would step aside. I mean, this is something that Vince, I think, would have to be pried from his cold, dead hands. And this past week, by the way, when I heard Vince was going to appear on SmackDown, I said, oh, my God, cool. Let's hear what he has to say. You know, does he does he does he talk about this? I would imagine that's what he's here for, at least, you know, in a general sense of saying, you know, these allegations, I'm going to fight them. You know, I'm going to kick their asses. I'm going to kick the lawyer's asses or or I'm going to fight this and, or, or at least say like whatever comes of it, I'll accept the responsibility, whatever. And instead, the geriatric Vince McMahon comes out and just repeats the same video package we saw that, that the signature that appears at the beginning of every single show of then, now, forever together. Okay. Which I think is like super wishy-washy. It, it, it's, it's too like, butterfly feel good oh we're all together nonsense okay anyway I, i'm not a fan of that but vince comes out and he just he mentions he's it's a privilege to be here and then says that you know uh the, it's, that he, he said that there's some important words at the beginning of the show it's then now forever and the most important together welcome to smackdown and he throws the microphone and walks out I, and i'm thinking to myself First of all, I tweeted, I I go, that's it. This, that's all you've got to say. There's nothing that you want. Like you're under investigation, a huge scandal, the biggest wrestling company in the world, the head CEO, the man that created and coined the phrase sports entertainment, who took this sport and made it a national global phenomenon is not going to say anything about anything. He just comes out and says literally nothing. And people are, I mean, I have my hands up. I go, what what the F was, what was the point of that? And after my just shock and anger and and annoyance that he didn't acknowledge it at all, I dug and I thought a little deeper. Number one, from a legal perspective, would I want to say anything publicly that could come back to bite me? You know, what would I say there that if I didn't want it to come back in a court of law, if this is taken to court, whoever knows, who knows, this could be played back. I mean, everyone will hear every word you say. I don't think it's smart from a litigation perspective. When you're under, when you're under investigation, you just keep the hell, you keep quiet and stay the hell out of the public's eye. So that's number one. I understand that. Number two, and I think most importantly from Vince McMahon's perspective of why a Vince McMahon would do this. It's defiance. And it's also a message. Boy, they love their messages. This was actually one, though, that that he's sending to the crowd, to the audience, to everyone who's investigating and accusing him. We're together, or, or I, I need you to back me here. And that's why he emphasized together, meaning I need you to stay with me throughout this investigation. And also a big F you of I'm not hiding. It's an ego thing. Here I am. I'm not going to hibernate and put my head under a desk. Here I am. And that's why he flips the microphone. That's what it was. 
it was defiance and it was a message that I'm not going anywhere and that I'm that I'm here to stay. At least that's right now is what he's saying, I think. And that's what it was. So legal standpoint, he's kind of the, the, the phrase I was using or trying to find last week was actually gag order. When you're not, you can't say something. If you're under a gag order, you cannot say something legally or you'll get, you know, you, know, you could be arrested or fined. But I don't think that's the right phrase here, but that, that was something I was looking for last week. It was it was gag order. I couldn't come up with it. Um, but with Vince McMahon, it's defiance and it's being smart from a legal perspective of not saying anything. So he wanted to come out and just show the fans, hey, I'm here. I'm not hiding. Look at me. That's it. So, <laughs> I mean, it pissed me off. I still would have, to me, it actually, I understand why he did it. I actually don't think it was a good idea. I would have just stayed the hell out. It, to me, it did nothing. It served no purpose from a fan's perspective or his purpose, pers- his purpose and his perspective in his mind. I think it did because he's like, ah, see, I showed them. I'm not going anywhere. I'm Vincent Kenny McMahon, damn it. But the fans are like, well, if you've got nothing to say, just just do your investigation and shut up. Like, don't waste our time. <laughs> and it was just also a kind of a cheap rating pop, I think, because, you know, if you're on an investigation, but you're going to appear on the show, like what? So people tune in, get absolutely nothing. And they're like, what? All right. So anyway, I wanted to get my thoughts on that because I thought it was absolute garbage, hot garbage that served no purpose other than Vince McMahon's ego. Seriously. All right. So anyway, got so much going on this week, guys. It's just it's crazy. Okay, so what else happened here? Um, I want to start. Let's start a little bit more with SmackDown here. Mad Cat Moss defeated Happy Corbin via pinfall in a last laugh match. I mean, this was okay. After the match, Corbin interrupted the announce uh, announce desk and, and he confronted Pat McAfee, making jokes about him. And Corbin said if he didn't stop, he'd throw McAfee in the ring and make him wish he was dead. Excuse me, McAfee then had the crowd chanting uh, laugh Corbin or had the crowd laugh um, quote laugh Corbin out of the arena. And so looks like there's going to be at some point, probably in the very near future, a Corbin versus Pat McAfee matchup, maybe at money in the bank. So, but anyway, the match between Mad Cat Moss and happy Corbin, it was fine. It was fine. You know, I'm looking for progress from Mad Cat Moss. I think that I'm seeing it in ring and on the mic, he's still not the most interesting guy. But I think he's progressing enough to keep people's interest. And as far as Corbin goes, maybe it's time they drop the name Happy. I I mean, I haven't seen Corbin Happy for a long time. So perhaps they do another character evolution of Corbin. Who knows? Natalia then cut a promo on Ronda Rousey. She was vowing to be the first woman to make Rousey tap out. And she challenged Rousey for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Or when she challenges Rousey for the, as as, uh, Rousey would like to say, the SmackDown Championship. Because that's what like a five-year-old would say when they don't know the proper name of a belt. Seriously. Uh, But at the Money in the Bank event. So Natalia, again, peeking her nose into the main event just to go back to, you know, putting cat ears on and doing Instagram videos and doing, you know, like how, how, how high up can I push up my boobs and to make myself look good again? Like that's, that's unfortunately for Natalia been her career, right? Like she has these moments of main event that are, you know, about as, um, about as often as, you know, um, Vince McMahon putting together a coherent sentence doesn't happen often, right? So Natalia cut a promo. It was fine. She talked about the sharpshooter being the deadliest uh, submission maneuver in WWE history. I mean, there's some validity to that because of Bret Hart, but only because of Bret Hart, you know, um, Ronda Rousey, I guess was injured from that sharpshooter. So, I mean, I'll buy it. Let me go with it. I'm here for it, I guess, because Natalia doesn't often get the main event. So I'm happy for her from that perspective. But just like the Brock Lesnar, Roman Reigns match, there is precisely, and I did calculations and I was up all night. I did some logarithms and, you know, I use sine, cosine and tangent. Yeah. Because I, I I failed math seven times. I think I failed calculus. No, failed six, failed once, 
dropped out five times of calculus and passed it on my seventh time. That's a real thing, guys. Like, for real. How about that? <laughs> There's some little info you didn't know you uh, needed to know. I am a god awful mathematician. If I ever need to calculate anything for you, just just don't let me do it. Okay. But anyway, I was up all night and, uh, you know, just going crazy with my math. And uh, there's a precisely, I found out, and this is rounded to the nearest hundredth, a 0.00% chance of Natalia beating Ronda Rousey, which weirdly also matches the same percentage that Brock Lesnar has to beat Roman Reigns at Money in the Bank. So, I mean, I don't know, coincidence, whatever, but I can tell you with absolute certainty with my math, uh, mathematician skills, that is uh, the calculation. That's the, uh, that's the formula, the result of the formula I came up with. So, all right. Um, New Day then defeated Jinder Mahal and Shanky. Oh, God. Via pinfall, Kofi Kingston hit Mahal with trouble in paradise. Shanky was in control before Xavier Woods played the trombone and then forced Shanky to dance and said, I mean, this, this was guys, um, this was bad on so many levels. Not only because New Day is, I mean, I don't even know if they need to be there every week anymore. It's like they're on rerun and somehow they're just a hologram every week. They don't even need to be there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if like Kofi and, and Xavier haven't actually appeared in person on SmackDown in like a few years. And they've just been somehow superimposing them with CGI and holographics onto the screen every week because it's the same routine with the same sophomore crap. I mean, it's, it's the same thing every week. I mean, and then trombone is, you know, still being used somehow after, you know, 15 years of it being used and people still find this entertaining. I don't know how there must be some kind of spell. Um, I, I don't know. There's, there's some kind of spell or, or curse put on people when they walk into an arena that they're they're just like bewitched that they must cheer for the new day you cannot boo them i don't know what it is but i would resist that curse anyway um i mean that not only was that bad of course with the new day just by definition are going to be bad from a character not in ring in ring they're fine but the jinner and shanky thing you know shanky's a dude that has size and they try to come up they finally come up with a cute nickname because <clears throat> no one can just be by their name they always have to have some cute nickname which i understand oh marketing but to me you do it when it makes sense not just to shove one in the skyscraping shan how many times i think we heard skyscraping seven eight times to drill it into our head that oh, oh he's got a cute nickname now but yet the dude is a skyscraping i don't know behemoth whatever they said and yet he's constantly obsessed with dancing and it reminded me of credit to anthony DeMarco on this of uh remember when in the mid 2000s i think it was like 2007 2008 when we had the great Kali start dancing randomly he just started dancing and they just took it away it, i mean they took away his monster gimmick and they just started having him dance it's like that but worse because Shanky has not had a really good match at all yet. I mean, the great Kali, you talk about limited, my God, but he had a presence. He could play that monster heel. Shanky looks like a dude because he's so young. Like he's in high school and he knows he's a big dude, but he doesn't know how to like hone his look yet. And he just feels so green. And he is, but he feels that way. It's not like he's fooling me at all. And they're just having him dance. To Jinder's music or like any music at all. And that's how they lost the match because of the trombone. And the, 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 the whole dancing thing. I think the reason they're doing that is number one, they're trying to get him just at least people talking about him. I mean, I'm talking about him right now. Would I talk about him this much if he wasn't dancing? Right? Like, so mission accomplished. But I, I also think that they're doing this because they already have that big monster Right, like they have monsters that are like his, that are his size, that are already being those monsters, and they can't have multiple people being that same type of personality because they're so big. So maybe that's what it is, but I, I don't know. This is not entertaining to me with Shanky. 
Um, it's kind of weird. Maybe it'll grow on me. I hope it does. I don't. I don't really hate it. I mean, if you, if you by the way, guys, go check out the WFTW podcast. <laughs> the The name of the episode is uh, Shanky Trash. So check that out. I think you guys will enjoy it. Anyway, moving on. Adam Pierce announced that both Drew and Sheamus would be in the Money in the Bank ladder match. McIntyre attacked Sheamus when Pierce announced that he was in the match before finding out he, that he also would be included in the match. Now, why Pierce couldn't have said, you both will be appearing in the matchup instead of you know, telling Drew, hey, Sheamus is in the match, waiting like 10 seconds until you know Drew attacks Sheamus and then telling Drew. It, the, the timing was weird and then the phrasing was weird, but fine. You knew them both. They were both going to be in it. If nothing else, they would have had a rematch there tonight. Why they needed a whole segment to figure this out and why Adam Pierce needed like a seven days to figure out how they're going to fix this. I mean, this is something that, you know, a, a seven year old who just started watching wrestling two weeks ago could have easily been like, oh yeah, WWE would just do this. Right. And both of them are in the match or they have a rematch. They got to have a winner, blah, blah, blah. Nope. Yeah. So anyway, I have no problem with both of them being in the matchup. I think it's going to be fun. So, okay, let's move on here. Money in the Bank qualifying match where Kel Rodriguez defeated Shayna Baszler with the, uh, the scoop powerbomb. Good matchup. Uh, again, uh, Shayna Baszler is playing the role of jobber for, you know, the, um, I don't know what the, how many months in a row now? Like 30 months in a row since, I mean, honestly, the last time Shayna Baszler was really relevant, and I mean really relevant consistently, consistently was WrestleMania 36. After WrestleMania 36, in the quietest WrestleMania of all time that we all pretend didn't happen, with Becky, and she lost to Becky, which was a shock to us all, she went off a cliff. Off a cliff, which is a shame. Because Shayna is capable of really good matches, of believable aggression, presence. She's got a gimmick that makes sense. She looks like a certified badass. And yet they relegate her now to just those those 10-second embarrassing promos that mean nothing. And they're the most scripted promos of all time when they walk to the ring. When is the last time anybody took anything? And I'm being serious from those promos that when people are walking to the rig and, and, you know, we're supposed to believe anything they're saying it, there's nothing that has ever, ever come from those promos. And I understand someone would say to me, well, you know, at least they're getting promo time, but if they're forgettable throwaway promos, I'd rather have nothing. Seriously. If they're going to take away from the matchup because they're just dry, then I, I'd rather not have them. But anyway, Shayna Baszler loses to Raquel Rodriguez. And that's not not to say it's not a slight on Raquel. I'm just stalking. I'm talking about Shayna Baszler in a vacuum. Raquel Rodriguez has got a great presence. She's got a great look to her. She's a big girl, strong, yet feminine. It's a great combination and a decent promo. She's got a nice presence on the microphone. I'm high on Ra- Raquel Rodriguez. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Shayna's out of the Money in the Bank qual- uh, matchup, but Raquel Rodriguez is in. All right. Max Dupree. Yes, did I say that right? I can't get high enough, nor will I try to embarrass myself on the show. But Max Dupree did. You know what that reminds me of? Remember Fandango when he he the dancer? He actually had a little bit of something going on at WrestleMania. I forget what WrestleMania was where people doing were doing the quote Fandango. And then WWE the next night on Raw tried to capitalize it. And there was like four people in the audience who were doing the Fandango. They thought it was going to be something that caught on fire. And unfortunately, it didn't. But uh, it was kind of like that, like where he would be obsessed with people tr- pronouncing his name correctly or he wasn't going to come out to the ring. People would say Fandango and it was Fandango. I remember that. Uh, I remember Jericho even making fun of him. He, does he sell movie tickets, right? That kind of thing because of the, the app. Anyway, reminded me a little bit of that. Um, I don't particularly understand this. Is he? A, he's a dude that recruits male models. That's, that, that's what it is. And we're supposed to be uh, hooked by the fact he's going to bring out like, you know, magic mic performers. Is that what this is? What, what exactly are you doing in a professional wrestling company? If you are a, a male talent uh, recruiter, but it's for modeling. 
Why is he in a professional wrestling company? You know, I don't know. But he complained about the lighting. He he let Adam Pierce he let he berated Adam Pierce, and Adam Pierce just took it like a like 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 a beta male just just like sat there like a fool. I mean, of course he was facing the camera because it's the only way you can face. But he was just sitting there and he's just taking it from this guy that just walked in the company. Anybody else notice that? Like, you know, he'll talk back to Drew or Sheamus or you know, whoever. No problem. But when it comes to Max Dupree, who's like three quarters of an inch from his face, he cowers? What? And the guy just walked in the company? The guy's been in the company as long as I've been doing this podcast. I mean, the, just this episode, right? Like, he's been in the in WWE for the last 45 minutes. And yet, he he doesn't have the balls to to talk back? And just takes the the uh, abuse from Max. I mean, I guess it's supposed to just get heat on uh, Dupree, I guess. And he's an interesting little character. I mean, he's obviously a heel. So we'll have to see what comes of this. I don't hate it. Again, I don't hate the gimmick. It hasn't even really had time to breathe. We haven't even seen what this looks like yet. But it could be one of those things where this gets strung out for months. Where it's not the right lighting this week. And next week, the ring announcer didn't pronounce somebody's name correctly. And then the following week, they he's upset with the placement of the show that, the, you know, like, in other words, he should be the main event of the show. You know, like it just keeps going on and on and on and on. And, oh, you didn't have the right carpet in the ring this week. Like, you know, that kind of crap. I hope that doesn't happen. This is let's just let's just see how you execute this male model gimmick. I'd love to see it. I have my doubts. Are they just going to bring in like talent every week, like local wrestling talent? Like, how does that work? Uh, this is very weird. So we don't have any maximum male models this week, guys. I'm sorry. Sorry to report. I know. Devastating news for most of us. All right. Uh, let's just briefly touch on Raw. The Money in the Bank qualifier between AJ and Seth Rollins, easily the highlight of Raw. I mean, can we have a 60-minute Iron Man match for these two? Can we start like a, a petition? A petition like a, you know, um, what is that big petition page? It's not GoFundMe. That's the fund me page. But um, there's like a petition you can sign. Can we start one? Can we get Seth Rollins and AJ in a 60 minute Iron Man match? That'd be brilliant. They were just awesome. Um, Seth Rollins ends up getting the victory. A just awesome match. So definitely the main event versus what was actually the main event, which was Lashley and um, Theory in a pose off. I mean, what? <laughs> um, I mean, it, it was it was ridiculous. I mean, I, I don't know. And, and by the way, what? How much storage does Theory have on his phone? I mean, does the dude like? Does he have some kind of just uh, some iPhone that doesn't exist yet with like unlimited storage? I don't know. The amount of pictures the guy takes is just crazy. Uh, Mustafa Ali versus Chad Gable or Mysterio ver, uh, and uh, versus Veer Mahan. So um, I didn't, you know, th this matchup, Rey Mysterio. Look, Rey Mysterio is at the bottom edge of his career. He's putting over guys that he needs to put over. And I understand. But as long as his son isn't there to call him pops, I'm fine with it. All right. Let's see. Riddle versus Ciampa or Champa, depending on who the hell you ask. Or maybe he still has his first name of Tommaso, depending on another person you ask. Who knows? But the Judgment Day, um, or I'm sorry, Riddle versus Champa. Riddle ends up getting the victory after, I think, a really good matchup with these two. Not as good as it could have been if they had more time. Champa doesn't get any uh, mic time. They just brought him in. And if you're a, Ch a Ciampa fan, you have to be concerned about what they've done with him so far. You just have to be nervous. What they've done with him is have him attack two random people and then be putting a money in the bank qualifier matchup. How that was, how that happened. I don't even know. It's a bit weird. So, all righty, let's see what else uh, we have. I want to want to miss it. Uh, let's see. Jimmy Uso defeated Montez Ford. And I thought it was a really good match. Montez Ford, as I've always said, is, the star of the show here when it comes to that tag team. And by the way, the Street Profits on SmackDown. How does that happen again? No one cares. No one knows. I don't know because they shouldn't be there. But 
Um, can they talk about something like, can the street profits talk about like their own program? Why do they have to be the promoter for the, the event? You ever notice that every time they're doing their like hype talk where they just start like talking really exuberantly about what's going on in WWE. Like they have to give us a rundown, almost promote other matches, other programs for the event. Like it's, it doesn't make sense. I think it undercuts them. Like talk to me about your story. I know what's going on, you know, with, with uh, Roman and riddle. Like, well, I know what's going on. Don't, don't, you know, I don't know. I have a real problem with that. The street profits. It's not like it's, they've only done it once. That's kind of their thing. When they start going crazy and start like speaking for each other and high energy and all that kind of, stuff, it's always about like what's going on generally on the show. It's like, dude, I'm, I'm watching it. So anyway, um, and, and you know, Montez Ford is, a guy that's likable. Uh, I, I, Angelo Dawkins, I'm sorry, is forgettable. Anybody else like really high in Angelo Dawkins? I don't dislike the guy. He's, I don't know. He's just a, he's just there. I hate to say that. He just exists in terms of character. I'm not, de- I'm not devaluing him, devaluing him as a human, just as a character. He's, he just kind of exists. <laughs> I mean, I hate to say that Montez Ford, Easily the star of that. But um, okay, moving on here. We got Asuka saving Dana Brooke from an ambush by Becky, but Asuka is acting more like a heel by continuing to interfere. Uh, Alexa Bliss and Liv Morgan defeat Dewdrop and Nikki ASH to qualify from the Money in the Bank ladder match. So they got two birds with one stone here. Alexa and Liv Morgan both are in the Money in the Bank ladder match for the women. And good stuff if you are a fan of uh, Alexa. Ezekiel defeats Kevin Owens by countout. And by the way, Ezekiel, or rather, um, Elias is supposed to be returning this week for a concert. How much you want to bet he's going to come out with a beard? He's going to do everything he can to mimic the hair and strum the guitar. And that's what he's going to do. I mean, it'll be obvious he's wearing a, you know, a beard and hair like to mimic whatever Elias used to look like. And then Kevin Owens is going to try to rip it off him. And he won't be able to, and that that kind of thing. I mean, the crowd will know, but we're all going to play along to get under the skin of KO. That's what's going to happen. Yeah, obviously Elias. I hope is not real. <laughs> if Elias is a real guy, I'm you know, I'm going to question everything. Like I will fully believe we're in the Matrix. Okay, uh, let's see what else happened here. I think that might have done it. Oh, Rhea Ripley challenged Bianca Belair, uh, or didn't challenge her, judged Bianca Belair with her harsh war of words. I don't know. I mentioned this on my raw review that Bianca Belair is really just really starting to lose her, her um, momentum, you know? So I, I don't know. Bianca Belair doesn't feel as fresh as exciting. There's just, she's just kind of champion. I mean, she's still entertaining and she's an excellent in the ring and she's good on the mic, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just looking forward to not even necessarily the build of Rhea and Bianca, the execution because these two powerhouse women, I think it could have the match of the night. There is that distinct possibility that they could have the match of the night. I'm really looking forward to Bianca and Rhea Ripley. I have to say Chad Gable defeated uh, Mustafa Ali. Uh, We got again, Veer Mahan defeating Rey Mysterio. And then of course we got the oil baby oil uh, shot to the eyes from theory to Lashley in a pose down. This feels very much like Triple H and Scott Steiner when they were doing all these things. They had an arm wrestling match. Then they had like a, a bench press contract uh, contest. I don't think that ever materialized. And then they had like a, I think it was a pose off something, a pose down, pose off, something similar to this. And you're like, can you just get down to wrestling? You know, that's why I'm watching this. I'm not watching Mr. Olympia. You know, cut promos, get me invested, beat each other up. It's I hate to dumb it down that far, but it's kind of the basics here uh, and they're not going that road. And the worst part about this is they made this the main event of Raw. I mean, that that was just horrendous, horrendous. So, wow. All right, guys, I think that does it for me tonight. I really appreciate everybody, uh, you know, listening to this. And if you'd like to go ad free, consider Patreon dot com slash WWE podcast for a dollar. You can get everything ad free priority placement in the, in the mailbag and so much more. Also, go to our website, Patri- or, uh, WWEpodcast.com. Go VIP. Promo code Roman gets you 50% off your first month. Video, 
and ad free everything. And I know guys, I haven't done an after show or a, um, not, not just an after show, but a, uh, an after dark episode in quite a while. I do apologize. I'm trying to cram it in. It's not as easy as it, as it I thought it was going to be this weekend, but I promise you in the next few days, an after show and or after dark or both will be put in the feed. Those are available to you on Patreon as well. And uh, also consider Apple Podcasts. If you don't want to go anywhere and you want to use the Apple Podcast app only, we do have an ad-free button right there for 99 cents a month. So, okay, everybody, thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed the show. I hope I covered everything. I'm sure I'm missing something major. That's just, this is what I do, but I hope not. And thank you everybody for listening. Until next time, take care. Thanks for listening to the WWE podcast. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you don't miss a show or head to wwepodcast.com. And for all of these shows ad-free, head over to patreon.com slash WWE podcast. Until then, we'll see you next time.